Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Perfect Building Maintenance. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Avison Young, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laomi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Genova Burns, Handro Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, Maringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and these friends. New Jersey, Michigan, <laughs> variety of places over there. Princeton, Bamberger's, bakeries, putting cookies away, <laughs> daycare. Yeah. Ruth Tilden Scholar. <laughs> nah, I'm gonna work for a law firm. Greater New York Healthcare Hospital Association, and Health First. Yeah. Who is its eminent attorney? Patricia Wong, thanks for being here today. Thank you. So tell me about your, your parents. I mean, an, your father came from nothing. He, he was an orphan. He yeah. lived in a, on a mud floor with yeah. chickens. What? Yeah. My father was from a uh, village in Anhui province, which is north of the Yangtze River, sort of in a very rural area. Um, he lost both of his parents when he was young um, and was literally raised by the village. Um, he studied really hard. I mean, this is really a, one of those stories he studied. He tested into, he had a grandparent who really believed in him. He took a series of tests and uh, was admitted into a middle school in Nanjing, Nanking, up the river. Um, went there to live and that changed his life. He right, and you said him. to me that was like the MIT of China. Eventually, he went to Zhejiang University, Chekyang University, which was like the MIT of China. He was a chemical engineer. And then how does he end up at the University of Michigan? Yeah, he um, came to the University of Michigan in 1948 as a uh, UN scholar. Um, I guess that's a program that existed then. So let's talk a little bit about mom. Yeah. So tell me about your mom's side. They, yeah. were, they were rice merchants? My, my grandfather was a rice merchant. Um, they were from Shanghai. She came from a family of nine children, eight, sis, eight girls, one boy. Um, originally started, I think, with 13 siblings, and nine made it to adulthood. So she grew up in Shanghai, which is a much more cosmopolitan environment back then, even today, um, than where my dad came from. She was very, very spunky. She always wanted to see the world. And um, she sort of just, you know, was very, very active, very, very smart, very bright lady. Um, and 
in about 1948 um, when the communists were kind of just about to come into Shanghai. She was, all the foreign businesses were packing up to, to leave and she had some English so she was going around as kind of a gopher helping them, you know, do this, that or the other. And uh, in the course of this one day she heard um, a couple of American secretaries talking about the fact that J.G. White was relocating to Taipei, Taiwan and that they had an extra seat on the plane because they were looking for a secretary or somebody to go with them and applications the following morning. So my mom the following morning showed up. She was the first on line. I think she got there very, very early and her spunkiness um, is sort of evidenced in the fact that this American gal apparently came later. My mom got the job, by the way, uh, and this American gal said to her, you took my job. You heard me talking about this job, and without skipping a beat, my mom said, I didn't take anything from you. You're an American. You can go anywhere you want, and you could have gotten up an hour earlier this morning to be first online. Right, so she gets the job. She, she gets works the job. for this Mr. Pearson. Uh, George Kingdom Parsons. Parsons. Yes. And Mr. Parsons, subsequently, during the period of time afterwards, is her sponsor to come to America. Yes. And he yes. put up a bond, and he, you know, yes. he really went out of his way. Yes. And then also later on, when he was came to America, something in Yonkers. Over yes, there. they were so our godparents. Let's talk here. about your mother and your father. Yeah. How they met, because yeah. it was like a mail order. Right. No, 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 you can't no. say it like that. They oh, were I, introduced. They were introduced. This was not arranged. This was introduced. Oh, this was an introduction. Yes, and my mother was very adamant on that point. My dad came to Ann Arbor, and one of his classmates there was the husband of my mother's eldest sister. So my mother was number seven, and this was actually number two, and he, Grace, um, but they considered her to be number one. Um, so my uncle, what we called him S.Y., was in Michigan with my dad, and T. Grace was back in Shanghai with my mom. Uncle S.Y. wrote to my mother and said, I think I have found a suitable right. husband for you. And so they corresponded through the mail, and I asked my mother about this at one point. I said, so you were arranged? She said, no, 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 not arranged, introduced. We were introduced. This was modern and all of the rest. And uh, I'll tell you something, Michael. When I was growing up, my parents used to tell us all kinds of stories about how they knew each other in Shanghai, and they went to parties together, and so we said, that's great. It wasn't until I went to Shanghai in 1982 and met my aunts, my mother's sisters, that they said, oh, no, 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 they never met each other. This is the real story. So you got the truth. I got the <clears throat> truth, yeah. So now, later on, after Michigan... Mom comes because the streets are paved with gold. Yes. To America, and they get married. We have that nice picture. The University of uh, Chicago, Chicago. Chapel, yeah. Chapel Hill, a chapel where they get married. Yeah. And then your dad gets a degree. He received his master's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Michigan. He was then enrolled in a PhD program at the University of Illinois at Chicago Circle, and my mom got pregnant. So they moved east to uh, New Jersey, first to New York for a little while, then to New Jersey. Uh, my sister and I were both born in Jersey City. So you're born in Jersey City. As you were saying to me at that time, there weren't that many Chinese. Not at all. In, in Jersey City. So then you moved to Fairlawn. Yeah. The Fair, <laughs> Fairlawn, New Jersey. Also a community that had everything but Chinese. Yes. And we have pictures of you having a birthday cake and yes. other things. But you, you said your mother was really a, an energetic individual, and you, your mother would, like, do uh, clothing or piecemeal yes. work in the house? She made all of our clothing, all of the curtains, all of the bedspreads. She was extremely handy. Um, and, you know, neither of my parents um, really had anything. You know, my dad came here expecting to go back home. He was from the countryside. My mother came here. She went to Taiwan with a suitcase telling her parents, I'm leaving for my adventure and I'll come back home. And she never saw them again. Uh, so they, they really came here with nothing. And like a lot of immigrants, they said, you know, oh, this, this town has good schools. My dad's place of work was within walking distance. Right. He worked for Borden. Yeah. He, he walked, and 
So we moved there. Um, we now, you were, said to me, you know, as many immigrants, you know, certain people had cousins clubs going back many, many years ago. In, in a way, you, 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 your parents met people who had like, and they had Sunday dinner together. Yes, yes. Uh, they there soon developed a, a, a group, um, we used to call it the Chinese Community Club, and it was a lot of families that were similar to my parents who came over in that wave in the late 40s and early 50s, sort of in connection with some of the political upheaval in China at the time, and they found each other. So we used to see those people all the time, and they were our aunties and uncles and, you know, our friends. and. Um, we spent a, a, a fair amount of time with them. Now, when you were, when you said it, when we were getting together, you lived in Fairlawn. It was a nice community, a bedroom community. You had a small house. You had the park. You had your own park. But you, daycare. What was the daycare job? Oh, so that was my first job. My first job when I was 13 years old. I got a uh, job in the church daycare center taking care of little children. And that was, um, my mother was very insistent that we all, uh, you know, get a good taste of work early so that we would be ingrained with that. So after the, ethic. after the daycare, how do you get the job at the kosher, at oh, the Jewish the bakery? bakery. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't kosher, but it was a Jewish bakery where the, your, your job was with the cookies? Yes. So um, this was a, it actually, I think it was kosher. Oh. Yeah. But the, um, the bakers were were Jews from Hungary and Austria, and they made the most delicious, you know, all kinds of baked things, sponge cakes and hamantaschen and bow ties and special things for the, for the Jewish holidays. And one of my jobs, this was in junior high school, I guess. I used to ride my bicycle there. One of my jobs was to take the freshly baked cookies and put them onto the display trays. And because I had grown up in a house that didn't really eat those now, kinds of things. Now, was I, it $1.65 or $1.35 an hour? Oh, gosh. I think it was even less than that. I don't so, so that was one job. And yeah. then you said to me when you were still going to high school, mom found, I don't know how she found, she found uh, Bambergers in Paramus Park. Yeah. Well, my mom was working there. So she went back to work when my brother was, I think, in kindergarten. And um, she, was a, she was a salesperson there. She worked at night. She became a floor manager. And so when we were old enough, we all got jobs in Bambergers. Uh, my sister did. I did. My brother did something different. But, you know, we, now, we got the these wig, sales jobs. You were in the wig department, did you say? There was when, yes, there was. Housewares, wigs. Some. Wigs. I counted money. I was in the treasury, you know, collecting cash at the end of the day because people didn't use credit cards very much back then. It was all cash. Um, I was in the gift wrapping department, so I still, I'm like really good at wrapping a present. You know how much limited scotch tape to use. Yes, yes, yes. I loved wrapping. Um, I, yeah, I, I was in the makeup department. I did, you know, I did everything that they asked so, me to do. So you basically. graduated high school, and you said to me that your sister had been in Princeton. And at, at, and at that time, what happened? It was something with a lobster. Oh, yeah. So it, back then, you didn't go visit colleges. You just looked in the book and, you know, sort of picked... My sister was at Princeton. My parents showed remarkable restraint in not pushing us in one direction or another. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go there. I wasn't sure really what college was supposed to be about. Right. You didn't know even know what you wanted to do. Didn't know what I wanted to do. Didn't know really in anything about college. And I went to visit her one weekend, and they happened. It was a beautiful spring day. Princeton is a beautiful campus. And they happened to have this lobster dinner. It was one of the student activities, and I said, I, you fell I gotta come here. <laughs> so, you're, you're, so you're at Princeton, and you said to me when you were at Princeton, it was like me, since I'm a pretty good typist, the way that you earned additional revenue was you work for Kodak doing typing. Yes, those were my summer jobs. I worked in the typing pool, and in school, um, you know, I, I really, I made all of my extra money flipping hamburgers and typing. Where were you flipping the hamburgers? There was a student-run food service. So I worked um, reunions. I worked all of the football games. Um, 
it was all hot dogs, hamburgers, things like that. So you graduated Princeton what year? 1976. So it's 1976. You really didn't, you didn't have any idea that you were going to become an attorney, right? I did not. So what happens in 1976? In 1976, um, I had met my future first husband-to-be, um, Philip Woodruff, and we went to Taiwan together. He was a um, student of Chinese history, and um, he was going there to do research or something like that. And I went with him, and I found odd jobs teaching English. We lived with a, a Taiwanese family in exchange for giving, uh, for doing conversational English lessons with them. So I was young and straight out of college, and I just, you could not go to China yet. I, I had a great desire to really learn more about China. I, in college, I majored in history and East Asian studies. I wrote my thesis on 20th century China. I really, I really was curious about So how about long it. are you in Taiwan? One year. And then you come back. And we came back. We went to Chicago because Philip was a student at the University of Chicago. And I got um, a series of jobs there, one of which was with an organization called the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association, which I think was listed at one time as a suspected communist front organization. <laughs> um, but it was before China opened up, so people who wanted to kind of have interaction with and promote interaction with mainland in addition to Taiwan and really learn about that big country, which was sort of a secret and kind of masked and cloaked to most Americans. I worked for that organization trying to um, promote teaching in the elementary schools about the big China. What, ha what comes next? Next, thanks to Philip, um, I was thinking about applying to grad school. I had really always thought about teaching as a career. And he strongly encouraged me to think about going to law school. He said, you have a great passion for standing up for people and being an advocate, and you should really think about that. And I said, I've never met a lawyer in my life. I don't even know what that means. Um, but as usual, you know, when, when people support you and believe in you, you kind of tend to follow that lead a so little bit. So how do you decide to go to NYU? Um, they gave me a wonderful opportunity through the Root Tilden Scholarship Program for um, folks who were interested in public interest law. And um, it was, um, you know, after the first year, it was a, a full scholarship and it was opportunities to be with, you know, people who were like-minded and uh, the school was just very supportive. So. And then you have a clerkship. Then I had a clerkship with the Honorable Whitman Knapp. Um, uh, former head of the Knapp Commission on Police Corruption, and he was he was an incredible mentor to me. He was my first. I graduated law school in 1984, so I was f almost 30 years old, and clerking for Judge Knapp was was the first time that I actually had a glimpse of my future as a professional, and kind of started understanding what it would be, what it would feel like, and what it would mean to actually be a professional. He was, he was just an amazing, amazing person. Then you fortunately get a job with a law firm. I got a job at a small healthcare law firm um, called Calcinus Arkizol and Bernstein. Um, and I worked there for a couple of years. Um, I then uh, became pregnant with my son Isaac. And then um, Philip and you, you moved to Michigan at then that Then we time. moved to Michigan because Philip uh, had a teaching opportunity there. Um, unfortunately, while we were in Michigan, you know, we had highs and lows. You know, Isaac was born there. Um, and We have uh, a picture of Philip and Isaac, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and then Philip gets sick and you move back here to, for his family because he had a brain tumor. He had a brain tumor and we moved back east because, um, you know, the opportunities there for him obviously were not going to pan out and he really needed a lot of care and attention and my family more importantly was frankly here. was here and they were they were absolutely So fantastic. now you go back to work for the law firm? I went back to work on a part-time basis and I slowly worked my way up. Isaac was was very young um, and you know my parents were tremendous. They took So how how did you get the job with uh, the greater how I got the job with the Greater New York Hospital Association was, you know, an example, I guess, of, you know, you just kind of leap when your gut tells you to. I was sitting in one of the partner's offices when a call came from Greater New York Hospital Association 
uh, saying we're looking for somebody to run finance and analytics. Correct. Finance and analytics. Finance and analytics. I, I think I'm you a were, lawyer. You're, you're a lawyer, a healthcare lawyer, but yeah. not, not, not financial statements. Right. I don't believe that right. the undergraduate program at Princeton really did that. Right. So I said, I'm interested in that. And I went and I spoke to Ken. It's an advocacy. Ken Rasky. Ken Rasky. Um, and I said, I'm not a CPA, I'm not an MBA finance major, but I am a really good advocate and I'm pretty good at math. <laughs> and um, I, you know, was doing reimbursement types of things now, in what, my what law is firm. The, what was the role of the Greater New York Hospital Association? Greater New York Hospital Association is a is large trade association. So they, fundamentally, they advocate to enact policies and, um, uh, operations that will assist their member hospitals. So uh, that's just the bottom line, whether it's regulatory or quality related or reimbursement related um, from the high to the low. I, I had such a range of experiences there. It was so you incredible. joined the greater in what year? 1991. So it's 1991, it's the greater, it's the beginning of the HMO movement really. Yes. And the preferred, preferred provider organizations, it was a, it was a Turbulent times yes. in healthcare, and it was also the start of the beginning of the mergers, which take place, you know, in the healthcare. People were trying to understand healthcare, and what happens one day when you're at the the greater? Yeah, so I had just started there, really, and the state passed a law saying Medicaid clients should have the opportunity to enroll in managed care plans. So it was the start of voluntary enrollment in Medicaid managed care. Ken came to me one day and basically said, the hospitals need one of those things. And I said, one of what things? And he said, to do Medicaid managed care. So I said, you mean like an HMO or an insurance? And he said, that's for you to figure out. So I, with a consultant and just, you know, over the course of a year, um, sort of developed enough consensus to create a company called Health First, which was really a concept, a prayer. The hospitals, the 10 or so founding hospitals, each capitalized it with like $50,000. We found a CEO for it, spun it off from Health First, and it kind of had its own independent existence and, and grew and thrived. And um, uh, I continued my career at at, at the Greater, but one day some there's a problem at Health First. Okay, yes. and the company was in turmoil, and the board did a search, and I was sitting in Ken Rasky's office, and the the search firm came in and said we're looking for X Y Z, and Ken said to me, "Do you know anybody who might be interested?" And I said, "I'm interested." So how did Ken take that? Um, you know, he got over it. I think he was a little shocked. Fortunately, my son had just gone off to college, which is what kind of got me to thinking about changing, you know. Um, and uh, over the course of the next year, I really um, had a very intense experience um, figuring out, uh, with help, lots of help from others, how to get the company out of that, that problem. Let's that talk about what Health First have. is today. So Health First today is about uh, close to a million four members um, in New York City and Long Island. We enroll one in eight of every New York City resident. Um, we are predominantly Medicaid and low income Medicare Advantage plan. We offer products on the New York State of Health, Obamacare, um, and we just launched a, um, a, small, a, a small group commercial plan. It's brand new, it's a baby. Uh, we have about $9 billion in total revenue. Um, we're top quality scores all around. Number one in Medicaid, you know, top quality in Medicare, um, and I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. And we have a picture of you and the, the Health First team. So after that, when you're, you're working at Health First, you meet somebody who is running uh, a small little company called the Empire Blues yeah. by the name of Mike Stocker. Yeah. So tell me how you meet Mike. Mike and I had actually met when I was at the Greater New York Hospital Association because Empire was going through the conversion and the hospitals didn't like that and so there was a lot of, so I would see him every now and then at meetings and he was a real personage in healthcare uh, in New York City. Kind of lost track of him a little bit uh, and I guess I was at Health First for a couple of years 
And I saw him at the annual United Hospital Fund gala dinner, which takes place in October of every year. And I will forever be grateful to UHF because uh, we kind of reconnected and started talking. And, and then you and Mike got married a couple of years ago. We have yeah. pictures of that. Yeah. Let's talk about your son and Mike's son, because yeah. they, Isaac and Luke. And Luke. Yes. So tell me what Isaac is doing. So Isaac is a phenomenally talented artist who is now really happy as a senior software engineer for a startup company called Intent Media. So he does all this computer stuff. Uh, it's basically an online And he's a great artist. We have a picture of one of his... Unbelievable artist, and he continues to contribute art to his company. You know, it's all young people, and they draw, you know, it's, it's a very different environment. Um, but, uh, yeah, he, he continues to create art, and he's doing incredibly well and then, at his job. Is he married? He's not married. Okay. okay. And Luke... Luke is 18, and he is a freshman at UC Davis. This is Mike's youngest son, his two older kids, John and Molly. Um, and, you know, I guess I know Luke a little bit better because he was still a teenager in the house when, um, when Mike and I got Right, together. and we have some pictures of uh, yeah. the entire family. Yeah, yeah. it's a wonderful so, boy. So, you know, it's, it's really great that Dad, you know, took the initiative to come to Michigan, and Mom... The, the really good situation was to go to Taiwan with the Mr. Parsons to come over there, and he he sponsored her. But I'm very happy to have the the CEO of Health First, Pat Wang. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Michael.